gentlemen, greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast with Todd Erzen and Aaron McIntyre. I am Steve Dace. Thank you for signing on here today to the program brought to you by our good friends at First Cup Coffee Company. They are a patriot coffee company that also makes some fantastic coffee good enough that Aaron just told me yesterday, hey man, I had to go back and buy some more and pay for it in my own pocket. Hopefully use the promo code. I forgot. Don't be me. (laughs) Be me in ordering more coffee, but don't forget to use the promo code. I just realized that this morning. Indeed. So save that 10% off at firstcup.com. Use the code DACE. 10% off the roast date is right there. There's a flavor for every freedom-loving American. Firstcup.com. Use the code DACE for 10% off. And if you subscribe, you get an additional 10% off for the life of your subscription. Get all of that. Firstcup.com. Use the promo code DACE. Um, A week from today, my next book, I guess we'll now call it my uh, Christian Nationalist Children's Book, uh, book two in uh, my trilogy of children's books on America's Christian heritage, Why Easter, releases one week from today. If you want to pre-order it on Amazon.com, you can do so. Why Easter, Jesus died for us so that we can live forever. Um, We're also offering... A very small run for the first time ever. We've done this with one of my books. We are offering a very small run of books we're setting aside. If you want them personally autographed with a particular message, there's only 250 of these. Um, If you want to, you want to make that investment, you can order those books at signedwhyeaster.com. That's signedwhyeaster.com. Uh, so if you want a, a personal message, you know, hey, um, can you sign this to uh, my, my kid in particular or a grandkid, signedwhyeaster.com is where we are selling those. There's only 250 of those, though. If you want just a basic autograph, you can do that at premiercollectibles.com slash whyeaster, or you can just get the run of the mill book and just, you know, write on it yourself if you want at Amazon.com. You can scribble on it and do whatever you want to it. At that point, you own it. All right. Uh, why Easter Jesus died for us so we can live forever, but you can get the personally autographed ones available at signedwhyeaster.com. You don't want to miss that. All right. Coming up here uh, on the program today at the bottom of the hour, we have been talking a lot, particularly uh, the man who sits to my right here. Uh, Todd has been talking a lot about the need to get out of our comfort zones well one woman is doing that well she's not alone but she's just one example one woman is doing that in the state of texas Uh, we will talk to jamie coleman coming up here at the bottom of the hour about that and then we're going to do something i i don't know have we done something like this before where we have taken an extended clip of someone else in our movement slash industry played it in context so people could hear it and then spent the rest of the time discussing it. We, we've done it with think pieces, right? We did this yeah. a couple of years ago with Evergreens. Uh, there were a couple of great think pieces written uh, that we spent the entire show going through those pieces and breaking them down you know, in depth and discussing them. But have we done that with a piece of broadcasting content, long form? I, I can't think of a time we have done that. Either. I mean, we've done this with documentaries and stuff, but yeah. not something produced by one of our peers. The uh, right after the special election in New York, which was yet another look at the results disappointment. Um, our friend and colleague Daniel Horowitz, who has no idea we're doing this, I didn't give him a heads up because uh, I, I wanted him to find out after we had already committed to it because he would try to talk me out of it. No, it's not that important. Well, it is. That's why I'm going to discuss it. Um, he went on. I'm, I'm just telling you, this is it, this is one of the most downright just borderline prophetic political podcast I have ever heard. Was it February 16th? Was that the date guys? I want to say it was right around there. Okay. It was right. It was, it was was that week. It was that week after the New York special election, but he kind of just went on this like Isaiah like rant on the state of the American right. And we're not, I just want to tell you right now, we are not going to do it justice. Like he could, he could take that rant and break it down into chapters and just make that an entire book. That's how I think just borderline prophetic his episode was. So I would urge you to go get Daniel Horowitz's conservative review podcast and listen to it in that, that particular episode 
in its entirety. I, I'll tell you this, guys. I listened to it three times. I've, I can't recall the, that I've ever done that. I've listened, you know, the way my mind and memory works, I don't typically have to do it, but there was so much I wanted to absorb in there. And then I wanted to go back and made that when I made the decision, Hey, I want us to discuss some of the themes he, um, he, he raises on our show. So I went back and listened to it again to carve out, you know, kind of a block of that rant. So we've got about 15 minutes of this podcast. Next hour, we're going to play it for you. And we're going to have an hour-long discussion for idolatry or not on this 15-minute clip. Can you discuss one 15-minute clip for an hour? Oh, you can this one. And we are going to do that coming up in the next hour of the show. Don't miss it. But first, let's begin as we always do with Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by Three Sentences, which is all we got from the White House and what they had to say about the murder of Georgia nursing student Lakin Riley at the hands of an illegal alien. Quote, we would like to extend our deepest condolences to the family and loved ones of Lakin Hope Riley. People should be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law if they are found to be guilty. Given this is an active case, we would have to refer you to state law enforcement and Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. Three sentences and a deferment of questions to another agency. We now know, thanks to reporting from News Nation's Ali Bradley, that the brother of the illegal alien murderer, Diego Ibarra, also crossed into the country illegally, surprise, surprise, and the second time he did so, he assaulted a Border Patrol officer. He was let off the hook after claiming epilepsy and went on to be arrested three times in Georgia before being arrested late last week for faking a green card. Democrat Congresswoman Katie Porter, your thoughts? Well, I think when a horrible tragedy like, like this happens, I think whenever we're dealing um, with violent crime, there is a sense of outrage, of sadness, and of loss. But I think the important thing to focus on is any one instance shouldn't shape our overall immigration policy. Learning Chinese today, today's phrase is, what about three instances? And now the real reason there won't be any presidential debates this fall, here's RFK Jr. On January 9th, 2024, Dr. Anthony Fauci admitted during congressional testimony that the six-foot social distancing mandate, quote, sort of just appeared, end quote. Dr. Anthony Fauci now admitting social distancing wasn't based on science. Fauci telling a House committee this week the idea, standing six feet apart, quote, just sort of appeared. The shocking admission comes nearly four years after statements like this. Every aspect of that ending the COVID outbreak in 30 days has some aspect of it of physical separation, whether that's avoiding crowds, whether that's staying six feet away from people, whether that's doing teleworking, all of it does that. Dr. Fauci also forced Americans to wear masks after admitting that they don't work. Right now, people should not be walking. There's no reason to be walking around with a mask. When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel a little bit better, and it might even block a, a droplet, but it's not providing the perfect protection that people think that it is. And remember when he said that the COVID vaccine would stop you from getting infected? The situation is so clear, the data are firm. If you get vaccinated, you are protected, even with the Delta variant. And while voices of dissent were silent, a Republican president and a Democratic president and their political parties and their members of Congress made the same choice to hand the keys of our nation over to Dr. Fauci. Then they stood by and watched as he destroyed our schools, our churches, our businesses, and our economy. The highest court in the Australian state of Queensland has ruled three years later that COVID jab mandates for police and ambulance workers in that state were made unlawfully. The Queensland government says the court's decision has more to do with how the mandates were made, not with the mandates themselves, so not a total victory. Google parent company Alphabet has lost $70 billion in market value over the past week or so after the unveiling of their artificial intelligence generated Oracle of the Spirit of the Age, Gemini. Checking in on the FBI with this post on X, quote, higher prices, dangerous products and closing businesses. These are just some of the impacts of organized retail theft on everyday Americans. Learn what the FBI does to combat these crimes on the federal level to protect shoppers across the country. Photo they chose to represent their post on organized retail theft is of two young white women shopping for clothes at a department store. 
And finally, checking in on the Italian television outfit Nove. And despite the language barrier, this is still pretty good. Buonasera, President Biden. Oh, President Biden. President, Mr. President. It's okay. Are you okay, President? Okay. Tutto a posto. Welcome. Benvenuti. No, di nuovo. Mamma mia. President, Mr. President, ecco. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, very good. Si sente bene? Yeah. Sì. Sì. Uh, eh? Thank you. Thank you. Mamma mia. Thank you very much. Ecco. Feel good. You are welcome. Buonasera. Dove va? <coughs> eh, Mr. President. Eh, oh, mamma mia. No, non arriva la metropolitana perché non è la metro. It's not the subway. Non è la metropolitana qui. No, no, no. What's your name? Con chi parla? Eh, Mr. President. Eh. My name is Joe Kennedy. No, Biden. Lei è Biden. And that's what happened while we were away. Mm, Aaron's montage brought to you by Relief Factor. Pain is your body's way of letting you know something is wrong. Most of the time, what it's trying to tell you is you've got too much inflammation in your joints. Those aches and pains you feel throughout the day, those are mostly due to inflammation. You can find ways, you can use drugs to mask the pain, but let's be honest, that doesn't work that well. And sometimes the stuff you use to mask the pain can come with different side effects as well. Uh, The other option is that you just fight what causes the pain. And a great way to do that is by taking Relief Factor. So if you're dealing with pain, please give Relief Factor a try. It's not a drug, but was developed by physicians who can prescribe drugs. And its four key ingredients work with your body to fight that inflammation. About 70% of the time, people who try it order more because of the results they see in three weeks or less. So why not see if you don't see promising results in three weeks or less with the three-week quick start from relief factor it's just 20 bucks what do you got to lose for 20 bucks relieffactor.com when you feel the difference you'll know it works relieffactor.com is where you want to go that's relieffactor.com there is another amazing rfk jr video that i shared on social media this morning i mean it's it is amazing uh we're going to show it to you and discuss it in today's overtime at blazetv.com slash dace. That's where you can go to become a Blaze TV subscriber if you're not already one for a discount. And if you're already a Blaze TV subscriber, you'll be able to watch it there later today. We'll record it after the show, and then we'll upload it for you to watch later today at blazetv.com slash dace, which brings us back around to Aaron's montage. Um, You know... This isn't a statement about whether or not, uh, you know, people should vote for him. I don't even know. Do we even know if he's even going to be on the ballot in our state? Have we even heard anything along those lines? I mean, I have not. You know? No, I have no idea. I don't even know he'll be even be on the ballot in Iowa. Um, this is this is just more. I, I know presidential elections are important. But they're not transcendent. Um. I mean, there was a there was a period of time that when I was growing up that Bill Clinton seemed omnipresent in our lives. Except when there's supposedly going to be a release from Epstein Island. When do you think about Bill Clinton nowadays? Never is the answer. You know, they come and they go Hobbs presidents and and elections. They come and they go. They're important, but they come and they go. What what you're seeing, uh, what you saw in that clip from RFK Jr. And you'll really see it in the clip we'll play in the overtime today. Those things are transcendent. I mean, you're talking about somebody who is analyzing events now and putting pieces together outside of the framework of real time because of their ability to analyze things or their willingness to be honest. That, That goes a long way. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that could do the same thing. It just requires being honest, first of all, with yourself. I mean, a, a willingness that I may, come up, I may come to a conclusion that may not fit my narrative. Most of us aren't willing to do that. That's why we're also not really good at giving analysis. But to Aaron's point about there's two reasons. They're actually both in Aaron's montage. There are two reasons you will not see debates this fall. Um, the first reason, and, and, and it's, in, in my opinion, it's by far the more preeminent one. Like, I don't think these are like 1A and 1B. I think this is clearly number one. It's the Italian TV uh, parody at the end of Aaron's montage. That, that's, that is the clear number one reason why you won't. 
They can't risk that. You guys see that clip going viral? Seth Meyers, I had no idea was even still on TV. Did you know this? I knew it was still on TV. Like I, I, had, yeah. I had no idea. Did not know he was still on TV. Um, but he had, the, he had the president on his show last night. And right in the middle of a clip where he serves him up a softball, hey, you know, what would you do to assure Americans you're not too old to run for president again? Dude glitches out in his answer. Right there. Right there. In many respects, guys, that's going to be, and I said this, you know, the day that the general began when Ron DeSantis dropped out, that's going to be the entire election. They have the they have the turnout model operation advantage, the which they have demonstrated in all these off year and special elections, over and over again. Well, I mean, I we used to not too long ago uh, refer to this as ballot harvesting, but since it appears nobody on the right wants to do a damn thing about it, including the Trump organization, then I guess. Okay, then I guess that we're just going to call it a turnout operation. And we, I guess we just have to bake this into the cake now of our analysis, right? No, yes. no one's going to do anything about it, it appears. Nope. And Mike Lindell is going to go to CPAC and tell Republicans, don't emulate it. Okay, cool. So if that's the case, if we're not going to do anything about it or we're not going to try to match it, then it is what it is at that point in time, right? right. Like you're a big baseball guy, right? There are, there's the rules and then there's the unwritten rules. Right? Yes. Okay. So, like, if Gaylord Perry's going to go to the mound with a fingernail filer and he's just going to, you know, in the middle of the game, yank it out of his back pocket, uh, file down the seams of the ball, and then start pitching, and everybody's like, oh, okay, that's funny. I mean, that's against the rules, right? Right. But if the umpires are not going to do anything and no one's going to protest the game and everybody's going to chuckle hut at it, then I guess it's. A sunk cost now at this point. That's it's just part of the game. Yeah, it's close. We're like all, all the steroid using freaks are, that's all, another on, great example. are all on one team and we've decided that's Correct. just how it's going to be. That's another great example. Yeah. I mean, Gaylord Perry did win over three hundred games. He's in the Hall of Fame, but he literally did stuff like pull fingernail filers out of his back pocket and just start, you know, massaging the baseball and then throw pitches. He literally did this. And I mean, I remember watching stuff on This Week in Baseball, laughing about it and stuff when we were growing sure. up and kids, you know, it was, it was how the characters of the game. Okay, I guess that's, <laughs> then don't be surprised when Phil and Joe Necro try doing it and other people start doing it, I guess, right? So if we're, good, if we're not going to, if, if no one on the right systemically is going to do anything about this on any level at all, at any level at all, and then on top of that, keynote speeches are going to be given at CPAC by people who have basically lost their personal fortunes calling this out that are then going to turn around and say, but, but don't emulate that. Don't do what they do. Don't exploit the same loopholes or unwritten rules or what have you that they do. You keep playing by the uh, rules no one's enforcing while they do their own thing. I mean, that's like recruiting against the SEC. I mean, so... I mean, they're just going to pay everybody under the... No, one of their teams are better than everybody else's. They already have a built-in advantage in that they're in the big population centers for football players in the Sun Belt, right? But how many of those were those guys were to get to come north if we're not paying anybody and they're paying everybody? You know what I'm saying? I mean, well, it's, t- it's against the rules, the schools up north say. Well, anybody being punished for those rules? No, in fact, they're winning in court, actually, just last week. So then uh, start paying players and get better at it, or you're in moron, basically. Okay, you're holding yourself to some standard that doesn't exist. That's kind of what's going on here. So from this time forward, I guess we just assume if if no one's going to do anything about it and we're not going to try to match it, then I guess that's just like recruiting against the SEC. You know, when they drop a bag, you're not getting that kid. So you just move on to the next. Right. Sunk cost. Nothing to do about it. Fair. Except for the SEC part. <laughs> All right. So here we are. Um, their turnout model's better. I guess we'll call it that nowadays, you know, since it's legitimized. So their turnout model has been demonstrated better. They hold the secretaries of state in almost every swing state we have to win. You know, they got a Katie Hobbs in Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan. Okay. Many of these places. Okay. So, all right, cool. So, and the Republicans are going to nominate someone who has 
a, a demonstrated a, a, a difficulty broadening his appeal. All things are fair? Yes. Okay, stipulated to? Yes. All right. So this entire election is the following. Joe Biden glitching out. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. That's just all going to ride on that. And I think that explains because 10 bucks to the poll jar on a, on a benign indirect reference. You are seeing very strange things in polling these days. Like I, like Daniel sent me a, a Emerson poll, which Emerson's a pretty good pollster, actually. At least they used to be, but we're, this is also on a cycle by cycle basis. Let me rephrase that. Emerson was a good poll, pollster before. We have no idea how they're going to perform this time. <laughs> All right. Before they were good. I don't know if they're going to be good now. Um, but like Emerson has Trump winning Pennsylvania by seven and the Democrat Senate candidate winning the state by seven. I promise you that will not occur. hundred percent. No chance. No chance on election night. About 250 days from today. There is no chance that that's going to happen. Cannot happen. Mathematically impossible. It can. All right. So how, so let, so is that a psyop? Well, here's one way it could be true. If you go back to last year and we kept saying all of last year, we don't see anything on the ground that indicates that Trump has this like 30 point advantage because we don't see like any energy on the ground like for anything in Iowa right we said that how many months last Mm -hmm. year and I and I I stated I I stipulated there's one caveat where the the poll could these polls could be true and a lot of times people don't understand that polls measure voter intensity just as much as they measure voter preference and that's often why if the pollster's honest and a lot of them these, these days aren't but if the pollster is honest, that that may be why that's often why you get an oversampling of one candidate or one side or the other, because their people are more energized and therefore more responsive to the polling. And if you're if you're going to be responsive to a poll about voting for someone, you're much more likely to go ahead on Election Day and vote for that someone. Right. So I, I stipulated one caveat where these polls could be true in Iowa is if Trump's base is uniquely energized, <clears throat> remember we had these conversations too, right. Trump's most hardcore base is uniquely energized at the expense of virtually every other facet of the right. Well, what did we see on caucus night? Exactly that. 14% of people, that's it. 14% of Republicans turned out to vote. That's all we had. And so the polls ended up being right because they were a reflection of that stipulation. That... Trump's most hardcore base was energized and nobody else on the right was. Here's how these polls of the general election could be correct. Because right now it's February 27th. I, I had a conversation with my mom this weekend and, uh, and she brought up politics. And as I've mentioned before, you know, my mom has a, uh, you know, my mom, like a lot of single women um, and single moms back in the day, hates Republicans, views them as, you know, corporatists, basically. But she's also kind of in no man's land because, I mean, I mean she just thinks the Democratic Party is just flat out communist at this point. So, all right, so she can't, she can't stand Donald Trump on a personal level. She thinks Republicans are corporatist whores and Democrats are communists. So she's, she's filtering things through a very microscopic lens right now. <laughs> okay. All right. Wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and, and she starts telling me about people in our family that, you know, she's talking to that have been hardcore Democrats for years. And they're like, I really don't want to vote for Joe Biden again. And, you know, we're seeing even in surveys that a lot of Democrats think he's too feeble to run for president again. So here's my theory or hypothesis on how today, it could be possible that Donald Trump is leading in Pennsylvania by seven and the Democrat Senate candidate is as well. Here's how it could be possible. A lot of Democrats can say today, and it won't cost them anything. Absolutely, Joe Biden's too old, too feeble to run. He should not. See where I'm going with this? Yeah. Today, they can say that, right? They can say it on March 28th. They can say it, right? Yes. They can say it on April 28th, June 28th, Yes. July 28th. Right. See where I'm going with this? But there's no chance that they won't vote for him in November. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's no chance. Yeah. And so if, 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 uh, come October 28th, you know, a week before the election on November 5th. Got to save democracy. Yeah. Now we got to say democracy must be saved. That's how that, that's how they could be accurate. Okay. That right now you are afforded the luxury. And remember, I kept saying this about Iowa too. There's this great block of people that are not engaged. 
that could swing these things if they got engaged in the process. Did they ever get engaged? No. No. And so they stayed home. Do you think that'll happen here? No. 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 Well, it could. It could happen here. And if it does, I promise the Democrat Senate candidate in Pennsylvania isn't going to win by seven points. The Republican will. Meaning these two things can't both happen. It's just impossible. All right. So um, one or, they, could, they could both be false. They can one be true and not the other true. But come election day, they both can't be true. Plus, you have to factor in. We're just going to let them count votes in Philadelphia County for as long as they need to find votes. You know. We'll be watching Rivalry Week Thanksgiving, you know, with the family and, you know, Chiron's across the bottom of the screen. Joe Biden's only 4,000 votes behind. The counting in Philadelphia County continues. And if you think that's even remotely parody, I don't know what to tell you. Fair? Okay. So um, right now, though, you're afforded like these family members of mine, and maybe you guys out there in the audience know family members like this. You are afforded the luxury of saying, I agree with you, Joe Biden's too old and feeble and should not run again. But come time, come voting time, maybe you'll still think that. And if you do, Trump will win. But so then the Republican Senate candidates, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That that level of split is not going to happen. Not. That's one way they could be true. And so Democrats know this. This entire election is, you know, is a Comey letter. Just like the, the Comey letter the week before the election. Hey, guys, one more reminder. Hillary Clinton's a total trash panda. Just one more. Remember that letter he sent to Congress? Yes. Nobody saw it coming. Okay. And that, that probably flipped the election. What, what Democrats need is for Joe Biden not to go on the Seth Meyers program. And when asked to, you know, address his fitness for office. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. If he does that, like a week before the election, Trump will win. If he doesn't, Trump won't. Oh, it's going to have to be worse than what you just saw. You think it would have to be worse than worse. that? Yeah. The second reason why there won't be debates is, is RFK Jr. is polling about 15 or 16 percent. And traditionally, I went back and looked it up. That has traditionally been the presidential commission on or the, the commission on presidential debates. That's traditionally been right around their threshold for a third party candidate. It's been somewhere between 10 and 15 going back many, many years. And he's right in that hot zone. So they would have to include him. Unless they came up, that's why I mentioned, do you know if he's on the ballot here? Maybe they'd come up with some ballot access exception. Well, yeah, you're pulling that high, but you're only on the ballot in 15 states or something so we can leave you off and we'll see you in court. Maybe they could try that. Don't think they wouldn't. Um, but for now, he's within the traditional threshold of being included. And nobody, not, neither side, Trump desperately wants to stage one-on-one -on -one with Biden. Both side, neither side desperately wants to share a stage with RFK Jr. They do, do not want him saying those things that he just said in that clip in Aaron's montage to 100 million people, especially if you saw the reaction on The View yesterday when Dr. Phil said them to The View audience. Full, Karen's galore. Right? You heard of the great Bond villain Pussy Galore? This is an even worse Bond villain, Karen Galore. That's the, that's the View audience. Karen Galore? What did they do when Dr. Phil went full red pill on them on COVID yesterday? Clap, 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 clap. They cheered like freaking seals. That's another mistake the DeSantis Super PAC made. All of their focus groups, remember I kept telling you guys, their focus groups are telling them you can't talk about COVID. Well, if you're focus grouping Trump's hardcore supporters, of course they don't want to be reminded of their guy's failure. But it, apparently there's a pretty big audience for it broadly in the country, as a matter of fact. People aren't taking the boosters. Even the View audience is cheering. So, I don't know. There, there appears to be a broader, a broader interest in relitigating this than maybe beyond we've got to get Trump reelected, which is the ecosystem that we largely live in here in writing media. Apparently outside of this, there's maybe more of a market yeah. for it than we were ever aware of. Which is why Biden is going to have to glitch harder because Trump has demonstrated he's apparently incapable of taking advantage of that energy. In another example, Katie, what Katie Porter said mm -hmm. with women just get, is he going to take advantage of that energy? That's why Biden's going to have to glitch out much harder because Trump is apparently incapable of taking these moments and running with them. I can't think of a better metaphor for the state of the country than an election being determined on whether an aging, decrepit generation that just won't go away will glitch out or not on its last lap around the track. Perfect.
You know, as we sit here today, babies' lives in the womb still hang in the balance. That's why I want to talk to you for just a minute about our friends over at Preborn. Uh, they need our help. Uh, they're a ministry that empowers young expectant mothers to uh, choose life when they're in crisis, like my mom was, pregnant at 15. Uh, Preborn has rescued hundreds of thousands of babies' lives through showing ultrasounds. Uh, that's a form of confrontation. It's a gentle form, but they are confronting the conscience of women who are considering the murder of their own children with the knowledge that you are carrying a child. That's another heartbeat. That's not your own. And when a, when a woman considers um, that heartbeat after visiting one of Preborn's centers, um, it's a divine encounter. And well over the majority of the time, she's going to end up choosing life for her baby. That's why we're proud to affiliate with Preborn here on The Blaze. Uh, they're not only working to save lives, but they're succeeding. They also know that mother needs support and help. They provide prenatal care, postnatal care as well. So the, first they bring her the truth, then they bring in the grace. All of this, by the way, is free provided they have tax-deductible donations to fund them all from people like us. Over the last 15 years, preborn centers have counseled over 450,000 women considering uh, killing their children, and well over 200,000 babies have been saved. These are amazing numbers. Let's do more. All right, if you want to donate, dial pound 250, say the keyword baby on your mobile phone, pound 250, keyword baby on your mobile phone, or... Just do what we do in our home when we donate. Just go to preborn.com slash Steve, preborn.com slash Steve. Well, our our show vision this year is dominion, to, to take control and influence the areas that you can control and influence. And you've heard Todd on our program talking a lot about a willingness to, uh, to get comfortable being uncomfortable, to step out of our comfort zones and confront the spirit of the age. We want to talk to a woman in Texas who's doing exactly that. Jamie Coleman joins us now here on the program. Jamie, it's a pleasure to meet you. Welcome to The Blaze. How are you? It's great to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us a little bit about who you are and your background. So I started my work in the policy world about two decades ago after reading the writings of Knowlton Friedman and became a huge advocate and fan of school choice and other free market educational reforms since then. I actually worked, I loved your pre-born ad right before this because I've also worked in the pro-life world. I think those two things go hand in hand. Um, but, But that's where I got started. Fast forward to today, I'm married to Ben, a Navy F-18 veteran. I have three younger children, they're nine, six, and four. I thought I cared about education policy a couple of decades ago. I had no idea how much more it would mean to me once I had my own children. So your your husband's a veteran. I understand he's involved in venture capital as well. Um, so you have a successful, he, he's successful. You have three small children. So it, it, it's not like you, uh, you, 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 can, you can live a pretty good life, but at the same time, you know, you have the, the, the busy challenges of three small children. So it's not like you need to add anything at all to your list of uh, to do on a given day. And yet you're willing to get off the sidelines here and run uh, for the Texas State Board of Education. Why? Because we have a we have a crisis in this state when it comes to education. We have um, more than half of our kids in Texas public schools aren't reading, aren't doing math on grade level. And then you add on top of that the issues that we have with what what they are learning, which is not reading and writing and arithmetic. Right? We've got trans guides being published by Dallas ISD here where I live. Uh, we have um, revisionist history being inserted into textbooks, into the curriculum. We have to fix both of those things. 95% of the kids in our state are in public schools. Um, I would love to have more choice. I would love to empower parents with other choices, but we still have to fix the public schools themselves as well. Primary is on Tuesday. My understanding is you're running against an incumbent. Why? I am. I mean, I, is I, am. It, I, I thought everybody uh, with an R after their name and everybody in, in, in Texas with an R after their name was was good. Not not so? <laughs> well, we wouldn't have quite so many problems if that were the case. So there are 15 members of the State Board of Education. So the state gets split up into districts. I'm in Northeast Texas here, starting in Dallas and going up, up to the north and over to the east to Texarkana. Of those 15 members, 10 of them are Republicans right now. So you would think that we would be running the table 
on things like improving the effectiveness of our curriculum, improving um, having patriotism and family values in the curriculum and not some of these revisionist history and other other unsavorable things that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. But we're not. We have, we have this go along to get along mentality. Um, we need fighters there. You were talking about fighters earlier. We need fighters in the State Board of Education. And I would argue that we need somebody like myself who has three little kids at home to really understand what the forces are that are arrayed against us. I see it day in and day out. I see the struggle with screens, with technology, with um, with what the left is throwing at us and trying to insert into the school day every day. Um, and, and nobody can understand that better than a mom of three young children. Did you, just out of curiosity, did you attempt to engage just as a mom, as a constituent, did you attempt to engage your rep on the State Board of Education before you decided to, to run for the office yourself? And if so, how did that go? So not specifically with my representatives, but as I mentioned, I've been in education reform for two decades. I have seen when we try to throw more money at the problem. Mm -hmm. I've seen when we try to propose actual reforms that empower parents, and I've seen how the education industrial complex jumps on that, fights against it. And if anything, in the two decades since I started out in this career, if anything, things have gotten worse, not better. I asked that, I agree with your diagnosis, obviously, but I, I asked that question because uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, Ryan Walters, is the superintendent of schools at the state right next to you there in Oklahoma. And, and to hear the stories from him both on the show, but then even privately, of the way a lot of elected Republicans, again, in Oklahoma, I mean, I, I mean, this is a, this is a state where you know, in a presidential election, Democrats almost can't win a single county, and 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 the reaction Republicans are he's hearing from elected Republicans down there, to him actually doing the stuff that's in all of your campaign literature and all your party platforms and on all ta- all the talk shows like this. I mean, they're losing their dang minds. Several of these people are to him actually getting rid of drag queen teachers, putting in patriotic education moments of silent or prayer time if you want that. Um, I mean, in Oklahoma, people are losing it. We we have seen the so many of the clips of of people who go to school board meetings and read out loud from the books of gay porn uh, that are in a lot of these libraries and the school board will shut them down. That's obscene. That's disgusting. You can't read that stuff here. But then we'll leave those exact same pieces of, of, of literature in the libraries for children to access that, it, that there, there does seem to be sort of an, an obstinance of um, you're not allowed here. You're, you know this is a this is a stronghold. You're not you're you're we don't, you're you're not entitled to give your opinion here. We are in total control of this. And and even if you attempt to inter to impose from the right, a lot of your fellow Republicans will will view you as a, a divisive force. Uh, you're making things worse and harder on us. And I'm just wondering if you've encountered that in your own interactions there with 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 your local educrat establishment there in Texas. So I think you're exactly right. And I've heard story after story about that, especially at the local school board level of just parents being kicked out of meetings, not being allowed to go there. You know, the Christian parents being ignored until, thank God, the Muslim parents were fired up about the same thing. And then they finally listen when it's multiple groups. Right. So I've heard that over and over. I would say at the state level, at the state board level, I mean, a lot of people will go give testimony and they listen and they ask good questions. I think the problem more at the state board level is that um, it's an unpaid position. I don't think that's a problem, but it's an unpaid position. There's no staff. And so what happens, I think you have people on the state board who end up um, delegating their responsibilities to the Texas Education Agency. So these are 1,100 bureaucrats in this agency. They may not believe, all believe the same things that you and I do. And so when it comes time to say, rewriting the history curriculum, they say, okay, let's fill up these working committees, get us a draft back in a few months, and then we'll vote on it. And then the draft comes back, this happened in 2022, the draft for the new history curriculum, the TEKS as we call them, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, had crossed out any previous mention of radical Islamic terrorism, because that could offend people, even when you're talking about 9-11. Hmm. Um, it said that in, in Texas history, it said that the, that the Alamo was fought over slavery. It said that the Texas Rangers were racist. These are the things that are in 
were in the final draft that was meant to be voted on that day. And and thank God the state board, I will give them credit. They said, you know what, we're gonna table this to 2025. But I argue that that process should never have been allowed to get out of control like it did. And we need people who are vigilant and, and let's stack the decks with people who are on our side instead of letting the bureaucrats do that. There are people around the country listening and watching this right now who live in places like California, New York, Illinois, um, where, where they can't even envision having any agency to get somebody like them on the State Board of, of Education at all, who I'm sure are absolutely incredulous to hear that this got to the highest echelons of the educrat establishment in a state like Texas, which they view as some sort of, you know, uh, red state Valhalla, if you will. And so on behalf of them, let me ask, how, how is that even possible? And if it's, if it's that systemic in Texas, then what is it like everywhere around the country? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. How did that happen? I mean, the, the one silver lining of COVID, right, is that that parents finally were able to see what was being taught, see into the classroom or see what was not being taught in many cases. I think that has happened also at the state level. It's just, it's shown a brighter light. Frankly, I'm paying more attention than I ever did before or have in a while anyway, since I started having children. Um, one thing I'll mention since you brought up other states, it is so important that we get this right. Um, in Texas, because Texas now has even more school age children than, than California does. We're now the number one state as far as population of school age children. We also are not in debt like California is. So the textbook companies have to listen to Texas first and foremost. They will draft textbooks that are aligned with Texas values, with Texas curriculum, and then that is what filters through to the other states. That's an excellent point. So it is so important that we do it right here in Texas. I started off mentioning, I mean, you have a busy life as a mom, three small children. Your husband is a veteran fighter pilot. So obviously, you know, he comes from a uh, pretty uh, uh, well-trained, intelligent, elite stock. He's in business now. You guys don't need more to do. And no one would fault you at all if you, you know, hey, I've, we're, we're, we're building a business, raising a family. This isn't our fight right now. And you're getting engaged in the fight because you recognize for such a time as this. What would you say to, to people around the country right now uh, to encourage them to do the same, to follow in, uh, in the footsteps that you're in right now? Yeah, I, uh, you're right. I don't have time. Um, I, I'm, I'm also a small, successful small business owner myself. And I just came from leading a Bible study to jump home and, and, and get on this call with you. Um, it is only by the grace of God that he is helping me carve out the time to do this. And it is that important. I am blessed with the opportunity to send my kids to a great school where they are learning true American history and principles and, and biblical values. And we need every child in this state to be able, even in public schools, we're, we're not teaching the Bible, but we are teaching Judeo-Christian. We are teaching what our country was founded on is what we should be teaching. And, and those, those are things, no matter what your faith system is, that's what made these principles, made our country great, made our state great. And we have to see that continue. So I can protect my own children and I can get them the education they need, but I need to fight for the other kids of this state and the kids who my my kids will be growing up with and leading this state into the future. That's how you love your neighbors, you love yourself. Jamie, how can people get more information on your campaign if they want to? So you can go to my website. It's Jamie for text, Jamie for TX dot com. And you can also find me, of course, on Facebook, Jamie Coleman for Texas and uh, and on LinkedIn. You, you name it. But Jamie for TX dot com is my website. I'd love to have your support. Spread the news to your friends in North Texas. All right. God bless you, Jamie. Thank you so much. And good luck on Tuesday. Okay. Take care. Thank you. I appreciate it, Steve. You bet. So again, there's someone that, I mean, if, if anybody's got an excuse to, you know, live the uh, the life of American comfort, it's someone who's husband's an, an, an investment capitalist. She's got her own business. They've got three small school-aged children. And yet, hey. They're getting off the sidelines. They don't need the smoke either. They're, they, we didn't even talk about that angle to it, right? Okay. I mean, they're going to get, uh, if she gets elected, she's going to get Ryan Walters, Ryan Walters, okay, at the same time. So that'll be more smoke on the family. That's There's the other angle to that too. Yet 
they recognize the the gravity of this moment and they're going for it as a family so I, I, when we have examples we want to show you we, we want to show you and so that's what we just did well, I found it interesting when you were asking about um, the, you know, the Republicans currently on it, why we're here. And when she said, yeah, you think we should be, you know, steamrolling this place. We got 10 out of 15 seats are Republicans. Well, here's the thing with education. And she clearly demonstrated over multiple questions. Seems like a really nice person, but that her job on this board is not to be just a really nice person. Way too many people get involved uh, in education on the parent end of things, thinking they're part of the like P PTO mm -hmm. or the booster club. No. Even though you don't have any individual power when you're sitting on a school board, the power you have is when that educator tries to guilt you into thinking like you work for me, you always remind them, you're never, ever going to talk to me like that on any matter, on educational policy, on fiscal policy. I'm always going to remind you, if you work for us and all republicans parents have fallen for this just as much as anybody else which is why we are in this ridiculous position go out there and lead the fact that they're going to call you all that names is not the reason to avoid running that's the reason you do run we have no time the fact that they call you this names just because you understand like what up is up and down is down th this is simple Either you get involved on this, no matter what you have going on in the rest of your life, or the other side is going to make sure that your children are not yours. When you hear stories like we have heard from Ryan Walters in Oklahoma or what Todd just laid out, where, where, you, where you have opposition from sources that you would expect to have your back at all times, especially when you're being as bold as Jamie wants to be, as Ryan Walters is, that should light a fire under each and every one of us. Kind of the inverse, the good guy version of what Thanos says at the end of Age of Ultron, when his forces are defeated once again, fine, I'll do it myself. Because at the end of the day, the buck stops with each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. if, we cannot, if we cannot rely on people who have an R after their name, and there are legion of them in red states like Texas, red states like Iowa, red states like Oklahoma, it then becomes incumbent upon each and every one of us to do the job, run for the job that they are apparently unwilling to do. So hats off to Jamie for getting off the sidelines. Extremely well said there. We'll come back hour two. And an hour-long idolatry or not, sponsored by, or I'm sorry, inspired by our good friend Daniel Horowitz. Next. All right, back here with Hour 2 here on Blaze TV, Radio, and Podcast. I'm Steve Dace. He's Todd Erzin. He's Aaron McIntyre. Let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. You can email us, Steve, at SteveDace.com. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Gitter, Instagram, and TikTok if you listen via the podcast. Thank you. Uh, please, if you have yet to do so, or, or even if you have, maybe they'll let you do it again. Leave us a five-star review if you like the show, and if you wouldn't mind also. Hit subscribe, or if you're listening uh, courtesy of iTunes, make sure you hit follow. That way, every time we do a new episode, it will show up in your feed every Every single time and thanks to all of you that have done both of those things for us already as well thanks as well to our friends over at patriot mobile because for the last decade or so uh, they have been on the cutting edge of america's parallel economy they are america's only american mobile phone network when you make the switch today they offer dependable nationwide coverage giving you the ability to access all three of the major networks which means you get the same coverage you've been accustomed to without funding your enemies uh, and when you switch to Patriot Mobile, you're sending the message you support free speech, religious freedom, sanctity of life, Second Amendment, etc. Because they support all of those things as well. They don't use the profits you give them against you, uh, but to, in alignment with you as well. And their 100% U.S.-based customer service team, I can personally attest, is absolutely outstanding. They will... 
customize any plan for your family you would like. You can keep your number, keep your phone, upgrade if you want. Um, They'll find the best plan for your needs. If you're a veteran or first responder and you want to make the switch today, let them know. And they've got extra ways to say thank you uh, for your service. Uh, All of us, though, can use my name, Steve, as a promo code and get a free activation if you switch today at patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Make the switch today at patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Okay, idolatry or not, we are going to spend the full hour discussing this on the program here today. And I I listen to this, you know, I we get into football season. I've got so many other things I want to listen to that uh, um, there's there's football season for my podcast and then there's Daniel season. All right. So like August through December, I've got all my football podcasts and that's football season. And then January through August is Daniel season. All right. That's when I get a chance to now there's not nearly as much football stuff going on to take my because here's the thing. I, I listen to Daniel stuff year round, but it, get, it gets me wound up. OK, <laughs> I got I need a break. OK. And uh, and so football is my uh, my small s Sabbath break. So that gets I'm, you pretty wound up to. But to, for to different sure. reasons and different reasons. And I also know that, you know, it, it does. It's irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. You know, um, all the stuff Daniel talks about, though, is very relevant. So you just you get wound up and you stay there, you know, uh, but I'm, I'm back into Daniel season. So I'm listening to his podcast now uh, with football season done. And I, I, if you don't, you should be listening and tuning in uh, at, uh, you're looking for uh, his podcast. It's called Conservative Review. I'd highly recommend it. Um, if you like what he does on our show once a week, then, I mean, this takes it to another level every single day. What you're about to listen to is one of the most borderline prophetic political podcasts I have ever heard. And I've listened to it multiple times, had Todd and Aaron listen to it as well, that we're all going to listen to an excerpt, excerpt of it again here in a moment. But um, this was done a day or two after the, the special election in New York. The day after. The day after, thank yeah, you. February 14th. And so Daniel was giving an overall lay of the land state of the American right after another shellacking, look at the results, of the actual games. OK, we we keep winning the public opinion polls and losing the actual games and losing them badly, as a matter of fact. And so he gave sort of a, a wide angle lens perspective on where we are and why that's happening. Now, you need to listen to this podcast in its entirety. I, I can't get to all of it on the show. It's well over. It's about an hour. But we distilled it down to about 15 minutes that will get give you the gist of, of the broader themes he discusses. And then we're going to discuss what he discusses after that the rest of the hour here's daniel horowitz we are on our way to becoming like europe europe in many many ways you look at the economic system the immigration demographics but also the political system which is tied into that where you have an aimless mindless and ineffective right wing full of hypocrisy that can never govern or get elected, really. And therefore, you just continue down the same path. So just like in Europe, where despite horrible immigration and economic policies that really aren't popular, but the clear majority of normies, these just average voters that are, you know, still making it work, earning enough money, They'll continue voting for the left. And and that, you know, the left is two hands in Europe. It's either the fake right party or the or the left party getting the same stuff. Because all you have in opposition is this mindless reactionary right that's full of enigmas, full of paradoxes, and they're totally ineffective. And that's where we're headed in America. Again, in Europe, you have things like a demonic left-wing party, a right-wing party that's really liberal, technocratic, corporatist, the Tories. You have that in, in France. You have it in Germany with the Christian Democrats. And then you know, you have just kind of this reaction to it, which often will agree with a lot of their diagnosis. Oh, it's terrible. Look what they're doing. But they're full of so much 
baggage and image problems themselves, and often even intellectually, they're just mindless. They just remain ineffective forever. And that's why in Europe, if you notice, even these times where we thought we got someone in, like in Italy, it really just lands in the same place. We have the merging of the fake right corporatists and the reactionary mindless right into one party, the Republican Party. So we basically get the lowest common denominator of both elements, and therefore now Republicans of all stripes really are struggling to ever win an election again. So you get the lowest common denominator of the Mitch McConnell sort of corporatism, but the electoral image problems of Trump and and some of his movement that he has spawned, and I would say even more so than Europe, it's even more mindless because it's really not around any ideology, but just one man. And whatever distraction needs to suit his messaging at that given day. So you have, you know, obviously the Wall Street Journal, National Review crowd will want to blame it's all MAGA. And then the MAGA guys will say, no, the, your candidates aren't MAGA. They, they're, they're, they're milquetoast candidates. So they're losing. But really, they're, they're all wrong in two ways. Number one, MAGA versus, or, or I, I, I would say Trump versus the establishment is a false dichotomy. There is a third option that we could pursue. And we actually were successfully pursuing that before 2016. Moreover, the fact that MAGA and the establishment are separate entities in itself is a false notion. More often than not, it's melded into one. Meaning, after eight years of Trump control of the party, Trump has greater control over both the image of the party in the perception of the minds of voters and also the mechanics of the party. He has more control than Reagan ever had, than Bush ever had, than Romney ever had, or whoever else. So at some point, you have to take ownership for it. Is it all Trump? No. I mean, it's the whole shebang. We have the aimless, mindless Republican Party that it always was, except it's even more electorally unviable than it ever was because you have the lowest common denominator of of both elements working together. It's that simple. But first, you have to diagnose the what before you diagnose the why. Okay, the why is always going to be more controversial. People are going to have different opinions. No, it's this person's fault. It's this factor's fault. But let's at least not deny what is going on, the what. Because part of the problem we have is that There has been no introspection or soul searching as to what we want to do. We have have two problems. Republicans of all stripes, whether they're people like us, whether they're people like the MAGA crowd, whether they're people like the Chamber of Commerce establishment, they're all going to have trouble winning henceforward. Let's not deny that. We have a problem that we're facing electorally, that the left has this durability despite the unpopularity and destruction of their policies and how they have on paper a president who should get them a 50-state loss, but yet they keep winning everywhere. And then we have a policy crisis that even where Republicans are in power, we still get Democrat policies. And we need a plan to deal with that, and we don't have that. And certainly by denying the problem, oh, no, we're owning the labs and we're winning. We're winning on policy. We're winning on elections. No, no, we're not. Let, let's not lie to ourselves. Before we start accusing as to what the culprit is, who's at fault, let's not lie to ourselves about the what. Republicans are losing. We're not winning on policy. You know, we thought we were crushing him on, on the border. <laughs> Whatever happened to that Texas standoff? Notice it's a joke. They, I, like I told you, they gave them Shelby Park in return for basically Abbott standing down everywhere else. It was all a fraud. So much for that. So now we just have impeachment. 
of Mayorkas, which in itself will become a sideshow. Hunter Biden, Hunter Biden all day. That's all the Judiciary Committee wants to do. Nothing of substance. So there's no narrative. Until last night, 100% of my colleagues were all mindlessly, Trump's going to win all 57 seats. 57 states. Like, landslide winning. And the same thing, just like with 2022. Polls, polls. We're going to win half the black vote. We're going to win 60% of the Hispanic vote. We're going to win everything. And then, oh, you have an election result that's the opposite of the polls. Polls versus results. Polls versus results. So let's stipulate very clearly that losing that seat by eight points, like 50 other data points that we have from actual election results, does not work with an electoral model that they think is going to happen like a Bush Dukakis 1988. No. At a minimum, it shows a pretty good environment for Dems, or certainly more of an even one, not that we're just going to walk right into it. But I will tell you that if the environment on the ground is really reflective of these bogus, stupid polls that my colleagues get drunk on, then actually Republicans should have won that district if it's reflective of that environment. But nonetheless, not only is it not reflective of an auspicious Republican environment, but it's reflective of a disastrous Republican environment. It's reflective of 1964 or the Watergate 74 or 76 elections. And then, so you lose every suburban area. And then even in Red America, you go over to Oklahoma House District 39. There was a special election. Trump carried it by 26. The Republican won it by just five points. And by the way, this is the second Oklahoma seat that they've underperformed in even as they win. So the point is, it's not just New York 3. Ah, you had some rhino, liberal, uninspired candidate versus a much better Democrat. Um, but every sort of Republican everywhere is is underperforming. And again, Democrats are overperforming in every special election. They won the off-season or off-year 2023 November elections, the, the Virginia legislature. The um, Wisconsin Supreme Court, Pennsylvania Supreme Court seats, and even the Kentucky governor, and even in Mississippi, they underperformed for governor in that state. And then obviously following 2022. So in other words, what, what Republicans need to face is that the losing pattern that they started when Trump was president did not change when Biden was president, and that defies political science. At a time when they should be racking up 2010, 2014-style victories, they are not. They are not racking them up. Because the same theme that Republicans are losing independent voters, when there's more Democrats than Republicans, so you got to win independents, they're losing them big, they're losing more and more suburban voters. That is staying even against Democrat. You might think, okay, they're, they're upset with Trump, but Trump is out. Now you have a Democrat. But no, that it's, it's two things. I want to make it clear. There's two independent things that they're facing, both of them. Number one, mechanically, they're facing this early voting mail-in ballot turnout machine that they have not found a way to match. And they, they don't have a party funding or an apparatus to do it because the party is completely destroyed and has no competence left to it. And number two, even beyond that, there is a macro environment that is continuing to be a headwind against electoral viability for all sorts of Republicans all over the map. Okay, both of those are true. They're losing independent and suburban voters just image-wise. They've fallen out of favor with them. And then turnout-wise, they're getting swamped by Democrats. Rather than engaging in any degree of introspection after 2022, we did the same things. Trump, McConnell, McCarthy, Rona McDaniel, all four. We, we, we went with the same presidential candidate, same RNC chair, same everything. Okay. So what, in my view, what you have is, is it only Trump? No, of course not. 
But Trump is the biggest face of the party. You can't deny that. To your average voter, they don't know about Lankford or, or Chip Roy, you know, either on the good side, bad side. They know from Donald Trump, okay? He is the face of the party and has been very evidently for quite some time. What you have is the impotence of the old GOP just tethered with Trump endorsing the same people, but his tantrums, his lack of decorum. So you put it towards everyone. You have Republicans focused on Hunter Biden. They focus on this. And like I said yesterday, even when they focus on an issue, they don't focus on it in the way it matters. They don't use leverage to drive policy outcomes. And here's why that's important. It's not just important because mechanically you have to use power or lose it. In other words, classic example, when you're in power and Democrats start with the mail-in ballots, you have to confront that. If you didn't confront it, you're going to lose it. And they lost it. Okay, let's not, not forget. That was Trump's fault with the CARES Act, with his COVID lockdowns. He enabled this entire electoral model that the Democrats have. But because he is so not focused, and yes, he controls the RNC. Okay, that is his outlet. They have no ground game. They have no ground game, but they also have the image problems. Okay, so that is continuing to this very day. Now, also, the problem is people don't realize that there's something interesting, something counterproductive. People think typically the more you go and do things that are unpopular, the more you'll lose. But actually, the worst thing is to speak about issues but not fulfill them. Because in the minds of normie voters, they, they, they don't view the system as corrupt. They think that if something is implemented, oh, wow, there must be legitimacy. Hence, Democrats didn't engage in a civilization debate over, are we going to lock down? Are we going to mandate? Are we going to wear masks? They just frantically did it. They mandated it. And, and normie voters were like, wow, I guess this is what we have to do. We have to wear a mask. Republicans could do that in reverse. They could, like I said yesterday, take something, a new cycle on immigration, on training, and implement, implement, implement. And voters will see, wow, I guess that's where it's at. There's one state where we did that in Florida, and it showed results. Instead, we just have this mix of Trump and the old establishment, but it's really not a dichotomy. It's one thing. You get the image of Trump, meaning pre-Trump, Republicans didn't have as quite as bad of an image, and they were more competent in terms of ground game. So Republicans won every other election, and they would win very big when Democrats were in power. They would win the midterms, the offseason, the special elections. Now, 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 it didn't do us any good because it was a uniparty. Policy-wise, they would do the same. Now, we have the same policies, but a lack of electoral viability. So we have the lowest common denominator of both. Remember, the more you accomplish and actually do, the more you swing public sentiment. So they can't shoot straight. They can't function. They can't do anything in the House. They don't unite and stand for anything. So ironically, if you poll people on the issues, they would agree with us. But Democrats continue to win. We've gone backwards. There's no narrative. There's no accomplishments. They're not doing anything. Even in Texas with the border, it was all a fraud. Whatever happened to that standoff? Because we've valued theater, memes, Twitter, talking points. We have a mindless movement. We have no policy people. We have no political people. We just have mindless talkers racking up an audience that's nowhere near enough to win an election, but certainly a, enough to, you know, it's a big country, so you could grow a brand with a million listeners. Can't win an election with a million people in a country of 330 million, but you could earn a lot of money with subscribers and clicks. And it's just mindlessness. So it's this re... So what we have now is the more we fail, and at failure theater, the more Democrats succeed on their policies, which they are, the more ticked off our people are and the more reactionary we get. And we're just completely ineffective.
All right, that's a 15-minute excerpt from the uh, Valentine's Day podcast from our friend and colleague, Daniel Horowitz. I'd highly urge you to go and listen to the entire thing. We're going to discuss that clip, though. All the major themes that he talks about in that hour are included in the clip you just heard. He just gets into some more details and specifics. And you know why we're mentioning our friends and colleagues here at The Blaze? Our good friend Sarah Gonzalez has a brand new show that started this month on The Blaze as well. It's called Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered. Five nights nights a week with a no-holds-barred take on news, politics, and culture. She's joined by regular guests and newsmakers to help make sense of all this madness. You can watch it right here on Blaze. TV, Sarah Gonzalez, Unfiltered, her YouTube channel. Listen wherever you get podcasts. Sarah Gonzalez, Unfiltered is where you want to go. Trust me, you'll like it. She's a cool chick. All right. We'll get into some of the specific things that Daniel discusses in the next segment. But I, I want to get each of your sort of big picture views of what you thought the first time you listened to this in its entirety, kind of your your wide angle lens to his wide angle lens if you will. Well, I'll be fascinated to hear more about what you have to say and why this blew you away. Because when you announce something like this, this is what we're going to do. It's a couple weeks down the road. We don't, we're going to have that conversation on the air. So I don't probe it. But after doing that, this is the second time in maybe, I don't know, six months. Steve, uh, remember the conference I've referred to several times. You went to with a bunch of elder statesmen in the evangelical community. Oh, last May. Invited. Yeah. So last May. Okay, yeah. so yeah. that. But this is the second time in, so nine months, I've been really surprised, and I want to hear more details about why you had the initial. I was surprised because you were a revival or bust. And then when somebody said, well, do you know what that's going to look like? And you were just like, whoa. Uh, this one too, because to me... I get the privilege of sitting next to you all the time. He's to me, he's saying stuff that in one way or in another, you you're on the same wavelength of all the time. I'm actually a little lost. I'm not, I want to hear more from you. That's my response about what it was, what it triggered in you, because I don't, I heard Daniel being Daniel and I hear you being, you. I don't see like any. I'm, I'm genuinely a little lost on what, because you're... I, so you think we just wasted our time? No, no, not wasting your time, but I, I don't I don't know what it was that... It seems like you're on this page every day to me. Mm-hmm. I, that's what I want. And so I'm, I'm either missing something or there's something deep in here that triggered you in a new way. Like, you, you know what I say on the show all the time? I try to figure out a new way to say something. It's the same thing, but the just to put the words together in the right way that finally is breaks everybody out of the trance. Was there something in there that a new way that just triggered? Yeah. I I think overall there are dots connected, which I'll get to next segment, but one in particular that I think is vital. Cause that's what I want to hear because there's, there's one in particular. I, you may have other ones, but I think there's one in particular there that is vital to explain our current political predicament. I just want to be clear. Not a waste of time. We, it seems like we just do this on our show well, all the time that's... because it's so important, yet you saw something in this in particular. To that... me, to me, what stuck out, I don't know if this is your motivation, Steve, but this is like a very condensed version of, oh, we talked about that last Tuesday. Oh, we talked about that last month. Oh, we talked about this particular issue just yesterday, mm-hmm. and it was all condensed mm-hmm. into one like 15-minute package here. Mm-hmm. My overall view of what we heard from Daniel Horowitz... The American right is sitting in a dinghy in the horse latitudes. While the American left, while the American left is on a gigantic ocean freighter, just putting knots behind them, putting miles behind them, just onward, onward, onward. Listless vessels on the right are never going to stand up to gigantic ocean freighters. That's that's what I got. I got this visual of just a small boat stuck in the doldrums, not really going anywhere. They see the freight freight liner coming, the ocean freighter coming. They see where it's going. They're really pissed off about it. But ultimately, we've got a little dinghy here. This vessel isn't going to do it for us. I don't I mean, tell me I'm wrong. That's the overall message 
that I heard from that entire yeah. conversation. And he's right. But I know you feel that way every day. We have these conversations where start, Steve comes in. I feel like this all the time. I know you feel like that all the time. That's why I'm just genuinely fascinated about what Cosmic Tumblr clicked into pace for you that just really like, because, hey, let's face it, when light bulbs go on in you in certain ways, sometimes they're in the shower, you know, books get written, movies get made. I'm genuinely fascinated well, he, what happened. He, he has a book right there with that rant. Because what, what he essentially did <clears throat> in many respects in that one rant is encapsulate like two or three years worth of programs in in one episode. Yeah, we've lived it. While yes. while while but it's it's one thing though to live through it. It's another when someone else from, you know, ten thousand feet connects the dots to make it make sense. Mm -hmm. The the analogy of Europe and that this is essentially exactly where Europe is at. You know, I I would tie this to what happened in what happened to the right what happened before the right in Europe became the caricature that Daniel described? Europe, the, the church in Europe abrogated basically all of its influence in the culture. And so now you essentially have, he calls it a reactionary right, but you essentially have a godless right. And we're up against the clock, so I don't want to go into this topic before, because I, I won't be able to finish it. But there's a there's a key illustration that he makes that I think it's the best way I've seen it put by anybody yet of a of attention once I item once I once I quantify it for you when we come back you're going to be like oh yeah that makes a lot of sense but I've but I've never heard it articulated against the backdrop of this is exactly what happened. Uh, in Europe, uh, and we're going down the exact same road because we're this is this is what's happening in Western civilization. There's a pattern. the The church abrogates, doesn't get defeated, doesn't get driven underground. Uh, just just quits. Just just decides it's not interested anymore. It just it's bored or it's got other concerns or it doesn't care or you know we're in you know I think it's Revelation two or Revelation three. Jesus says I'll, you 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 know go back to the things you used to do. If you don't, I'll come to you and take away your lampstand or the salt has lost its savor, so it's been thrown out. I mean that all of those things to varying degrees apply, but for whatever reason, the church just stops. Being in, interested in being a beacon of influence and, and 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 of light, and so something else has to emerge to take its place. And what happens when that something else emerges is it actually thinks it's doing good, but in many respects, it's making things worse. I'll explain this when we come back. Looking for a more sane way of life? Well, Ridge Runner has land in Appalachia ready for you. No better time than today to move your family out of a blue state hellhole and go to a place that doesn't have hostility towards morals, uh, belief in God. Uh, Ridge Runner picks pristine land in rural Appalachia with top-notch natural beauty, value, and location. You can move to a Ridge Runner community and be surrounded by people who have the same values you do and you won't have to lock your doors. Natural beauty is abundant as well. So if you've got that pioneer spirit, you're ready to join Appalachia's rising future as you build yours. Schedule a call today to learn more about Ridge Runner properties, whether you work from home, hunt, fish, homestead, or are just looking to run livestock or just be a part of a community where your way of life is prized, Ridge Runner is ready to help you find the ideal property. Small acre lots start as low as 35K. Um, large 100 acre holler farms, well priced at under 400K. Ridge Runner has options for anyone seeking to go back, as Todd likes to say. Uh, if you want to take uh, get more information or take a visit, you can visit RidgeRunnerUSA.com today. RidgeRunnerUSA.com today. Again, that's RidgeRunnerUSA.com. What, what Daniel did here that I think in the clip you just heard that is I think is prophetic is that he took years of developments and distilled it down into one epic rant that makes it 
genuinely understandable and accessible if you are willing, if you've got ears to hear. In many respects, I think that Daniel's rant is 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 kind of what we did with the book Fauci and Bargain. If you listen to this show every day, there's, there was very little new in Fauci and Bargain. If you listen to this show from March 16th, 2020... When was the book released? March 28th, 29th, 2021. Mm-hmm. So if you if you listen to the show every day from March 16th, 2020 to when the book was released a little more than a year later in late March of 2021, if you listened every day, you didn't hear, you didn't read anything new. We didn't break any ground. How many people can listen every day? Not many. How many people can recall everything that they listen to all of the time? Not many. Okay. People, we do this full time. It's our jobs. Everybody, for every, everybody outside of this studio... It's not a, it's not for them. Well, unless you're the blaze uh, or an advertiser and you're monitoring the program or our friends uh, over at Media Matter. So let's not forget that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Shout out. OK. But for the people that are are listening to us benevolently, this is not their lives. This is a part of their lives. And, and the reason why Fauci and Bargain was, was such a smash hit is because it took all of that content, all of that work that we did for a year and made it accessible in one volume in a couple of hundred pages, which given the amount of information in that book is, is pretty accessible and, and made it so that whether you were just trying to, to send this to your pastor or elders to reopen church, you were trying to impact your legislature, the Freedom Caucus bought 5,000 copies of Fauci and Bargain. No matter where you were on the, the, the truth-seeking spectrum, this book was accessible to you. In ways that if you tried to follow these conversations every single day, would not have been for many people. That's what he did in that clip you heard with the overall state of the right. And I think the, <clears throat> the most important thing to understand that Daniel raises. And what he is, what he is quantifying for you is a godless movement. There's no plumb line here. There's nothing that holds us together here. Um, we have nothing in common here, really. Many of us don't, other than a mutual foe. And there is a time and a place in history. I mean, hey, FDR, Churchill, once you know, hung with Stalin for a while. There's a, there's a time and place in history where, where you can have co-belligerents you don't have anything in common with. But sooner or later, <clears throat> sooner or later, okay, what do we do now? All right, we won the election. What do we do now? You know, I used to talk about the Republican Party isn't a big tent. It's a big tarp. A tent has stakes. So there's, there's something so that the center can hold. A tarp doesn't have that. A tarp is not meant to have that. It's a temporary covering over... A storm. It's not meant to be. A, it's, it's meant to be a shelter, not a sanctuary. You can live in a tent. You can't live under a tarp. And so a tarp, the, the, the big tarp has no stakes. We all run underneath it to shield ourselves from what the spirit of the age wants to do to each of us. And then, you know, whether it, if we're lucky, like in 2016 or some other, you know, Tea Party elections, we're able to push them back through the, the, the peaceable electoral process. But when then, the, and now, you know, we feel like it's safe to come out from underneath the tarp. We can't govern. We can't agree on anything. I mean, Chip Roy is telling me that Mike Johnson, the speaker, is telling everybody you're going to have to vote for these uh, CRs in March and, and you'll get no substantive policy outcomes from it at all. Nothing. And yet, if that's the case, then we're better off, frankly, having Democrats in charge. Because right now, all the Republicans are doing is owning the blame. They're, 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 they're getting some of the blame shifted to them. They're giving the Democrats all the policies they want and then owning some of the culpability. If we're, if we're going to do that, then just let the Democrats take the blame for what their policies do to everybody. Rather than, you know, provide a shield. And yet, there's all kinds of conservatives that will call Mike Johnson a hero. At CPAC, they held a, over the weekend, they held a panel on the jab with Dr. Robert Malone. Who is in control of CPAC? Who's determining who speaks at CPAC, who doesn't speak at CPAC? Who's doing that? 
Who's doing it? Who's in charge of the Republican Party, guys? Donald Trump? Yeah. So who's in ch- who's determining who's everybody gets to speak at CPAC? Him or his close associates? Correct. Correct. How do we, on one hand, we, we cannot have a movement where, on one hand, we give a platform to all these dissident doctors, but then, on the other hand, make no substantive moves to do anything about this because it will then... We, we risk exposing who the face of our side is at the moment. And so you end up in, you end up with a, in a moment where you need Dr. Phil and Joe Rogan to do a better job with your belief system than you do. And by the way, do Dr. Phil and Joe Rogan for, vote, end up voting for a lot of the same candidates most of the time we do? No. So Dr. Phil goes and gets applause for, the, for what we've been saying for three years on The View. But what will be the electoral fallout of that? Nothing. Because we can't run on those issues. Because we're going to nominate the guy who's responsible for some of them. Just like we couldn't run on the Obamacare issue because we nominated the guy who was responsible for, the, for its progenitor, Romney Care. I'm, there's, I'm, there's, there's not a standard. And so here's what ends up happening. To hold this coalition together, here is the coalition we have on the right. People who have no basis of belief and are just technocratic corporatists and people whose basis of belief is being based. Now, I'm fine being based if it's based on something. What is it based on? If it's not based on anything, then I'm just insulting people. Jesus didn't just randomly go through Galilee and say, hey, look, it's the whitewashed tombs. Is that what he did? Did he just, did he just grab people and say, hey, it's the brood of vipers over there. Go make fun of him. Is that what he did? But he did call people whitewashed tombs and brood of vipers. Did he not? Yes. Did he randomly do so? No. No. Did he specifically do so? Yeah. Did he say, these are the whitewashed tombs. Yeah. These are the broods of vipers. Is that what he did? We're not doing that. So he was based, but it was based on something. Based on something. We're based for the sake of based. And so what ends up happening is when you just randomly call people whitewashed tombs, randomly call people broods of vipers, that creates a lot of bile in the system and a lot of blowback against you. We just make fun of people because you don't like them and not because it's based on anything that anyone else cares about. Like Jesus, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs and broods of vipers and the people applauded because they recognized he was calling out the people who led them astray. If you just make fun of people because they said something mean about you, you gain no political points for that and only back, you only get, you only get collateral damage. Wow. That guy's a prick. That guy's a douchebag. That's totally different than saying the media is the enemy of the people. Now, that's a different statement, isn't it? And you'll get cheers and credit for that. Do you see where I'm going with this? Oh, yeah. There, we, have, we, we have nothing. We are a baseless movement. We are a collection. A, I'll, 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 this term's on my mind because I did this right on Peloton this morning. We are a motley crew of factions, of non-communist factions, who, who for the most part, have nothing in common. One of the leading thinkers in our movement the last few years is an atheist, James Lindsay, who is critiquing critiquing my column for The Blaze before he even read it. And by the way, he's an atheist. It's not about him anyway. It's not for him anyway. Nor would I ask an atheist, what's the best way to maintain the integrity of my faith? Where in the scriptures do we ask non-believers to uh, help us to, to referee the integrity of our faith? 65 bucks, how many times that happens? Zero. Now, does that mean that there's no value for James Lindsay at all? Did I say that? No. No. But, but, but there's a fundamental difference between him and I, is there not? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I accept the most fundamental fact yeah, of human the, existence. There's the a God. One, yes. He doesn't. So other than that, though, we agree on quite a bit. But if we don't agree on the first fact, my goodness, does it matter what else we agree on? 
We are pretending as if the answer to that question is yes. We're a movement because some of the same people hate us that we don't like. Well, that that you might be in that might make make you a protest movement, but you're not going to be able to govern, and we can't. And so, essentially, the options we are offering the American people are the following: memes and trolls, and everything about the Republican Party they already hated long before Donald Trump came down an escalator. The, those are the, that's it. There's, there's no affirmative framework. That's what happened in Europe. Why did it happen in Europe? For the same reason it's now happening here. First, the church abrogated. If only God had come up with an institution that would like be planted in every culture and would like point them to where the North Star is at. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be something if God had thought about that? Oh, wait, he did. It's called the church. But first, the church in Europe just decided, pour one out, doughboy, peace out, we're done. Church in America is doing that as we speak. Well, you know, there's going to be people who are going to rise up, just nature abhors a vacuum, like a James Lindsay, and they're going to say, no, no man, I'm not, I'm not going comrade, I'm not doing that here. But ultimately, if they have no basis for being based, then, then, then th- that doesn't rally people. You're the French Revolution. They've had like 20 constitutions over there. Their current president was an androgynous disco dancer. David Bowie impersonator. impersonator. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Their previous conservative president, Francois Mitterrand, at his funeral, his wife and mistress both came. There's nothing there. May I? Because I totally understand why this singed you now after listening to this. And I'm going to use the own story that you often tell. uh, So there's this guy who comes out and says, I'm against the fundamental... uh, principles of uh marriage i think uh, society is out of control i think people are spoiled bats with no accountability says that maybe even gives a speech that day and then he goes home and he walks into his house and he finds his wife sleeping with another guy mm-hmm. and that guy sees him nods his head and says hey dude walks right by him goes downstairs gets in his fridge grabs a beer sits down ask him where's the remote asks him where the remote is this is the story you've told about another thing and the guy who just said i'm i'm all about marriage i'm all about accountability sits there hands him the remote says nothing Mm -hmm. does nothing accomplishes nothing and says well i guess that's how it is so i i hear that i told i i mean that's the that story was in there when you saw this and that exploded inside. That's what I wanted to know mm-hmm. because you could have said and have said everything Daniel did. But when it comes to it, down to it, this is the thing. Daniel just said, this should this thing should have toggled back and forth. The red wave Correct. should have happened just on the have. natural ebb and flow. Not even for highly I don't principled think, reasons. I don't think and our people understand what it means that Republicans can no longer just benefit by no. how bad Democrats suck. I don't think we've accepted because, that yet. And that's why we've got we've got Mike Lindell keynoting CPAC and saying, don't ballot harvest. Don't do what they do. Don't vote early. Right. Just let them do it to you instead. Yes. Okay, now of course, Mike doesn't want him to just do it to us instead, but is anybody trying to stop him from doing it to us no. instead? So again, what Daniel is saying is on every issue and yes. every fight, we get the worst of both worlds. On one hand, it's they get to do whatever they want. And on the other hand, we, have, we don't know what we want. All right. So we're, we're going to complain about ballot harvesting. Right. Mike Lindell is going to accuse Ron DeSantis of ballot harvesting. And then he's going to go to CPAC and say, but don't do what they do, even though no one's stopping him from doing it. Just keep letting them. I guess they'll just keep cheating. We'll get the wor- we get. Tell me where we don't get the worst of both worlds on everything. On everything. Oh, it's guaranteed. And it has to do with those normies he talked about. There's a principle in science called observer bias that... When you're doing an experiment, you 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 have a set of principles by which you're just evaluating data, and it's very hard to do that like a robot and purely objectively. So this person walks into his own house like this. 
if you're really objectively observing that data based on the principles you set down, um, somebody's getting hurt. That, there's a consequence. You've been saying there needs to be consequences mm-hmm. to bad behavior, okay? But our, uh, if our observer bias always does the opposite, this is your point, always does the op- I don't know what we do. Yep. I don't, you're guaranteeing yep. Correct. you're going to walk into that house with further nonsense over and oh, That's the normie effect. And the, and the economic point he makes, I think, needs to be driven home. You and I had the third highest selling conservative book of 2021. Yeah. That book changed the entire calculus in metric and financial worth and value of this show and the work we did leading up to it that book is the culmination of that era all right one point one 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 percent of one percent of books will sell the couple hundred thousand of those copies we've sold but in the grand scheme of things of a nation of 300 million people dude that is a nothing burger and there's a lot of people here thinking they're getting wealthy off of this. And, and, we're, and we're thinking because they're getting wealthy off of us, that means everybody else is tuned in. They're not. That's another key point. Romans 8.28.